Hey everybody, it's Digital Charcuterie. It's me, Andrew Fantasia. Thank you so much for joining me and welcome to the second episode of our brand new series, The Marvel United Deep Dive, as we look into every single box of United that I own and talk about what you get inside and how much each box is going to be worth in terms of bang for your buck. We have a whole point system uh, that we rank each box on depending on what's inside. If you want a full breakdown of that point system, check out our first episode of the Deep Dive, which you can find in the description below. Another thing you can find in the description below is a link to Amazon where you can buy my fantasy novels, We Were Wizards. They come in hardcover, they come in paperback, they come in ebook. They don't come in the form of a kindly old grandfather telling you the story at your bedside, you know, Princess Bride style, but we're getting there. Be patient with me. We Were Wizards is a delightfully fun adventure fantasy story that I have been cooking up for many, many years, and it's my pride and joy. So if you love fantasy and you love reading and you just love supporting authors who are not, you know, already on the shelves making tons of money, maybe consider picking up We Were Wizards and checking it out for yourself. So today on the Deep Dive, we are going to be talking about our first expansion box uh, we're going through all of season one first, and then we'll jump into seasons two and then three. But for now, it's time to hop a plane, go all the way over to Africa. Unless you already live in Africa, in which case, yeah, hop a train, because we're going to visit Wakanda and see everything in the Rise of the Black Panther box. So let's go hit the table and take a deep dive together. All right, here we are. It is Marvel United Rise of the Black Panther, a.k.a. The Wakanda Box, uh, which actually would have been a really fun name for it. Marvel United, The Wakanda Box. <laughs> I would have liked that. This is one of the most basic expansion. When I say basic, I mean the expansion that you get the least amount in, in Marvel United terms. One of them anyway, definitely not the least, but it's still a good one and we're going to see why. Let's quickly and carefully flip it over to the back so you can get a look at what's in store for you. Again, nicely colorfully laid out as we've come to expect. Let me flip this back over. I hope nothing inside has gone haywire now. All right, let's take a look inside. Um, one thing that I have come to love about Marvel United, among many other things, is that all these expansions are kind enough to come with a rules leaflet. Um, and I know some people have, uh, you know, they have their own storage methods and they've taken all the rules leaflets and compiled them together. I know the Meeple Monkey has that in his beautiful wooden, uh, I forget who makes them, but the wooden uh, towers of storage that he has. He's got everything kind of laid out there together, manual-wise. Some other people, I think, actually have bound them together in like a little binder or duo tang and just had them there like that, which I think is very cool too. Me, I just keep the boxes, so I keep every every box part with every box, right? It just makes the most sense to me. So let's read... What is in store for us here? Welcome to Wakanda. Despite their technological supremacy and widespread prosperity, the kingdom of Wakanda finds itself embroiled in a struggle as old as time itself. A battle for the throne. Eric Killmonger's oath of vengeance against the Wakandan king's bloodline has fallen on T'Challa, the current Black Panther. Not content to simply eliminate the Black Panther and his allies, Killmonger wishes to seize Wakanda for himself. To that end, he seeks to radicalize the population against their king, smuggling weapons and mercenaries into the country in preparation for a vast uprising that would place Killmonger on the throne. But the Black Panther has allies in the form of Princess Shuri and the Winter Soldier. Shuri's weapons and gadgets can turn the tide in any battle, and no one knows more about fighting a subversive campaign than the Winter Soldier. Yet even this formidable trio will be hard-pressed to prevent Killmonger's master plan. As the war for the heart of Wakanda unfolds, only the most skilled and most daring will rise in defense of the throne. So if I bored you just now by reading that, I only sort of apologize. Uh, I mentioned in my last video, I'm a big champion of reading instruction manuals. As a writer, I can testify to this. Somebody worked hard to write this stuff. And I don't like to write it off uh, and, and, and ignore it. So it... it Add some flavor to everything. I'm going to read them for every one of these deep dives we do. That's why it's called a deep dive and not a shallow dive. So as we flip this over, we get the beautiful uh, layout of all of our components, as well as the explanation of the endangered locations 
challenge, which we'll talk about in a minute. Once we remove our plastic protective covering here, whoa, once we properly remove it, Andrew, geez, uh, we can take a look at what's inside this box. It's very light. We have here our Rise of the Black Panther locations, of which there are six. The Great Mound, where all the vibranium comes from. The Royal Palace, which is my favorite looking location here because it's just beautifully designed. Everything about Wakanda is gorgeous. Shuri's Lab, which helps you heal, so that's handy. Jabari Village, where my friend M'Baku lives, and we still don't have him in the game one day. Season four, baby. Season four. The Warrior Falls, which was a beautiful scene from the movie. And the Golden City. So, six locations, a nice chunk of locations to add to the mix. And here is our villain dashboard for Killmonger. He was a very simple villain, because he has no special setup or anything like that. Killmonger's whole thing is he's trying to mess with the locations. He's basically trying to destroy Wakanda uh, so that he can take it over. So he wants to put crisis tokens down. And if a location has three or more crisis tokens, it messes with the location. Uh, and he's going to try to do that for as many as possible. I haven't faced him much. He was one of the last villains I faced because I go through randomly. So he's one of the last villains whose names came up. I think I've only faced him maybe twice in all the 350 plus games that I've played. All right. Here are our hero decks, right? Much simpler than the uh, the core box because there's only three heroes. So let's start with the man of the hour, right? Let's start with T'Challa, the Black Panther himself. I love the use of contrasting his black with royal purple, which is my favorite color. Uh, in the movie, they did that really well too. So the color scheme of Black Panther's cards ends up being something really special just to look at. The black and purple man, that combo, maybe it's uh, growing up with Disney movies. Disney villains loved using the black and purple combo. I'm looking at you, Maleficent and Judge Frollo. There's just something villainous about this. But at the same time, it looks so cool and heroic when Black Panther utilizes it. Uh, so he's got these great powers called the Panther Habit, which really just uh, lets him do many more actions than a normal hero would get to do on their turn. And that makes sense because he's like hyper fast and strong. Next we have, who's next? Winter Soldier, who seems like an odd inclusion in this box. I, and I know they only did it because in the movies, he stays and chills in Wakanda for a long while. But I would have liked if this had included somebody like Shuri instead or M'Baku. His cards are all right, you know. He's not my favorite Marvel character. I think he's just kind of boring. He's just a guy with a gun and a cyborg arm. But to each their own. I know a lot of people love him because of the films. And Sebastian Stan does a great job of playing him. So lots of aggressive stuff in his deck. He's a punch token kind of guy. And then finally, Shuri, the princess of Wakanda. She's got a big gun. Beautiful looking cards. They chose to kind of use her royal uh, blue and yellow color scheme for the cards. And boy, does it ever work. And she is one of the best healers in Marvel United, period. At least that I know of. Season 3 might have some really good ones that I haven't gotten around to trying yet. But she has so many cards where she lets you draw cards and fill up your hand, right? The Young Genius. I think they're all called the Young Genius. So you get to give wild tokens and do wild actions and heal. Um, I think in Japanese RPG terms, she would be a white mage or whatever, whatever the Final Fantasy term is for it. Someone who's just pumping healing magic into the party. So that is our three hero decks, which as always go on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side are the villain cards. And these villain cards belong to Mr. Eric Killmonger. So there are his threat cards. And he's not a henchman kind of guy. He's more about putting crisis tokens and hiring mercenaries and stuff like that. And then his master plan deck. And he will also duel with people. I think he's the first Marvel United villain that uh, uses the dueling mechanism, which was made even more popular by Silver Samurai and now in season three, Dakin. Now, it's time to take a look at these figures from my least favorite to my most favorite. So starting with Winter Soldier, who's just, you know, a guy. Uh, I think there was some sort of stipulation made by Marvel that they didn't want the characters to carry guns, uh, I think, 
Punisher's got a bazooka, so maybe that, that doesn't count as a gun. But Winter Soldier usually hoists a rifle around, and in this case, no, he's totally unarmed. He's just got his cyborg arm, and that's it. I think that was sort of something that the uh, the licensee told Simon to go easy on the guns, because this is a family-friendly game, and I get it. Guns in the real world suck, so... Keep them out of the game, sure. I, I understand. Uh, but that's the Winter Soldier, and I know a lot of painters have had fun painting the heck out of that silver arm. For me, I just leave it blue. Uh, now we'll jump to Black Panther, my next favorite miniature in this box. They really nailed the detail in Black Panther's costume. The little lines, right? The little All these little things that make up the vibranium mesh. Uh, they got that, including his necklace which is kind of the Wakandan version of a crown. That necklace is a big deal. But it's just Black Panther just standing there being all regal and noble. Uh, then we've got Shuri, who is just a great-looking miniature with her, her, not coat, but this sort of miniature thing flapping behind her, her ponytail flapping in the wind to show, you know, this. she's running. She's She's got stuff to do. She's not sitting around. Uh, the little uh, marks, the tattoos on her, forehead. Can we get that in focus camera? Is that going to work? They're there. They're uh, tangible. You can touch them. They're bumpy. Uh, and then, of course, she's got those big gauntlets that she can shoot things out of. So Shuri looks awesome. And then finally, Mr. Killmonger, uh, who just, he's my favorite. It's a, it's a close call. Shuri's awesome, but he's my favorite just because they managed to get all these details on him right his mask must have been very hard to do, but they did it. They got it all right. His swords being two different uh, lengths. And then to top it all off, what I think is the best part of Killmonger is the one little touch of humanity that we can see on him is if you turn him around, we get a glimpse of the back of his head and a tiny glimpse of his ears. Just to remind us, there is a guy in there and he's hurting right? If you've seen the movie, you know why he's hurting. But I just think that's really cool. It, it really sums up the character where this is the face he presents, this monstrous grinning tribal mask to frighten his his enemies uh, and, you know, these swords because he's aggressive. But if you look at him from behind, the side he doesn't want you to see, there's just a dude in there. And he wants to be more than just a dude. But at the end of the day, he is just a dude. So I I think that was a great call. Uh, to to add that and not have it just be like a wraparound mask kind of thing because that really helps uh, just sell the character, in my opinion. And then we have these, which you can see here, just these little cardboard tokens. These cardboard tokens here, one, two, three, and four, and there is a twin for each one, so there's eight total. And these are for the Endangered Locations Challenge. So the way that works according to this, is it gives you, the player, a more personal connection to a location. So when the locations are set up, what you would do is every player would also get one of these tokens. So I'm player one, I would get this number one token. And then I would choose a location at the beginning of the game and put my matching token on it. And now this location is inherently tied to me for the rest of the game. So if it ever overflows, I take damage. That's what happens. It's plain and simple. If it ever overflows, I will take damage. Hence, you want to stay on top of your location. And it creates kind of a cool thing because, yes, the characters are going to be working together, but they're also going to be scrambling to take care of their own location first because they don't want to get hurt. Uh, but then you can also help each other out to keep their locations from overflowing. It really makes for a, a fun, interesting kind of... Uh, play to keep track of on top of the villain. Almost every one of the season one expansions comes with a challenge. The challenge card also comes in here. It's just a challenge card with the endangered locations challenge and you can add this to your challenge deck if you're making that, which one day I will. Um, in terms of all the season one expansions though, this is by far my favorite challenge. The endangered locations, I think it adds just the right amount of difficulty without going overboard and it's not too easy either it's just sort of something to thematically link you with a place and considering that black panther's box is all about wakanda and protecting wakanda it matches the theme and the story really well too so 
I love this to pieces. And it might be if you're looking for a challenge and you're looking for something to add to the game, I don't think you could ask for a better thing to add in terms of season one. Uh, maybe in terms of most seasons, this really is one of the best. So that is everything that comes in this box. Now I'm going to pack it up. As I'm packing it up though, I will be adding things to it that don't come to it just because that's how I store the box. So I have Shadow King and Namor, uh, the villain decks for them. Those also go in here. Namor's hero deck, which I'm just going to throw in there, as well as equipment because there's a perfect spot for them. Black Panther's shield and spear. I have Namor's trident and I have Okoye's spear. They go right there. They do not come with this box though. And I also have Okoye, Feral, and Wolfsbane, and I keep them here as well. Just because there's plenty of room, and look, it's perfectly lined up. So if you are in the market for an expansion, uh, but you want one, whoops, you want one that's kind of on the cheaper side, cost-wise, and I wouldn't blame you, I don't think you can go wrong with Rise of the Black Panther. The trade-off is you don't get as many characters as you would other expansions. It's the lightest you could possibly get, three heroes and a villain. That's the least amount of characters any expansion box has. However, you're getting some pretty good characters, uh, particularly these two. And you're also getting a fantastic challenge mode on top of it all. If you want to know if the juice is worth your squeeze, at this point, I can say Rise of the Black Panther is definitely worth it. And that is Rise of the Black Panther. Now it's time to break it down and see how many points of worthiness this box is going to get you. The box comes with only four minis, which is the lowest that a United box can get, as far as I remember. So that's four points. Three of those minis are heroes, so there's another three points, with one villain, Killmonger. That's two points right there. You get six locations, which is pretty good, not too shabby. That's three points. And then finally, the Endangered Locations Challenge, which grants us an extra point for a grand total of 13 points. I know that seems low compared to the core box, which had 29 points, but remember, core boxes have a lot of stuff. That's what makes them a core box. This is not only an expansion, but it's one of the smallest expansions in the entire repertoire that is this game. Marvel United has, I think, in total 30 boxes when all is said and done. I think that's the number. And this is one of the smallest of the 30. So even though that seems like a low number, you're still getting some real good stuff in here, particularly if you're a Black Panther fan, because it's the only place where you can get Black Panther and Shuri. And those Wakanda locations, man, they don't disappoint either. So that has been the deep dive for Rise of the Black Panther. What do you think? Is this box for you? Is this going to be worth your time and money? Personally, I think it could have done with some more Black Panther characters as opposed to Winter Soldier, but I'm not picky. I still got those characters at the end of the day, most of them. M'Baku, where are you, buddy? So thank you so much for tuning in to this deep dive of... Rise of the Black Panther. Next time, we're going to hop on the Bifrost Bridge and take a trip into Asgard. So I will see you then, my friends, as we continue here on Digital Charcuterie to make the wait for DC Superheroes United a little bit shorter and a whole lot sweeter. See you next time.